Good afternoon, everybody. Since I've just met you, I'm going to stand up for a moment. Um, with me today, uh, this is a, by nature of a disclaimer, is my former colleague, my former boss, and my current friend, Alex Mahon. Right? I, um, I come from the past. I'm a television executive or a former television executive. And in some ways, Alex represents the intersection between that past and the future. Alex has just taken up a job within the last three weeks or four weeks as the chief executive and editor-in-chief of Channel 4, which is a unique public broadcasting institution in the UK. It, it was uh, established in the 80s as a, as a public service broadcaster with a commercial side to it. It has a stage-given remit that is, about, is, that is about being the alternative, the noisy alternative. It is a broadcaster that has always represented diversity in Britain, a kind of political and social edge, and has never been afraid of controversy. But more interesting in some ways than Channel 4, which faces a lot of the disruption that you are causing in the industry that I come from, Alex, Alex's journey as a business leader is very specific, and I want to explore a particular set of themes with her today, and those are her career and how that shaped her, which is somewhat surprising when we get into the detail, how that shaped um, her view of the responsibilities of a leader in, in uh, commercial and public life. And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges facing, or more about the challenges facing Channel 4 and linear television broadcasting houses like that around the world, right? You ready for this? I can't wait. Right. Good. So before we, before we start talking about your career, Alex, can you just tell us a bit more about Channel 4 so that we know where we're heading? Can you, can you sketch in the, the UK landscape and Channel 4 very briefly? So you and I, Gary, have worked in international broadcasting for a long time, yep. so different broadcasters in 150 plus nations. Channel 4 is utterly unique, so there's nothing else like it in the world. Um, it is, as you said, set up by the state, so it has a legal remit. It was set up in 1982, but it doesn't take any money from the state, so it's very much in the tradition of British public service broadcasting, but it's not a state broadcaster. So we make all our own money, about a billion sterling in revenues a year from advertising, and our remit tells us to innovate, to challenge, to reflect the nation, to cause debate, to, to stimulate debate, and to appeal to the audiences that others don't reach. So if you boil it down, the remit's about creative innovation, doing new stuff, you know, the point is to do new stuff, and appealing to diverse and different populations. It's sort of, for the, all the good things of social purpose, at scale. It's the, possibly the best television organization that exists in the world, because we also don't seek to make a profit. So it's at scale, you come into work, you're only there to do new, exciting, cool stuff and broadly to do good with it um, in a noisy, provocative, challenger brand way in, with maverick and risk-taking alongside that. Right, that's very interesting. Let's, let's set that. So Channel 4 also is the broadcaster that, that launched Big Brother at the, at, at, at the um, British public. And this was a turning point because it was very, very early on in the life of Big Brother. And in some ways, Big Brother as a, as a series defined channels, it's not on Channel 4 anymore and hasn't been for a while, but in some ways it defined Channel 4's brand, I think it's fair to say, as an entertainment uh, mm -hmm. house for many years. But let's start with you, Alex. You, um, you, you come from, a, from a, a, a binational family, right? You have American father, English mother, and you grew up in Scotland, yeah? Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I grew up in, in Scotland, uh, at certain points in the south of England, in America, kind of all over the place. You're making it sound quite luxurious, a binational family. I'm going to yes. take that. It's a little more low rent than that. Um, and what do you mean by that? I, I mean, binational nowadays implies yes. constant transatlantic jet set travel as opposed to... <laughs> but that's what you do. Well, in my mind, it would be more divorced parents who lived in two different countries. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we'll take binational. Um, and, but, I, but it did involve actually quite a lot of change. So I moved around a lot and I went to different places and I had step um, brothers and sisters. So I, I, I suppose in upbringing, I was already used to quite a lot of change. That's led me into the kind of employment where I enjoy a high degree of transition and change and quite like getting involved in challenging situations where disruption is required in the company. 
Right, so that's interesting. And you, but, you, but you didn't start out in show business, if that's what you're in, right? You went to university, and what did you actually study? This is the big reveal, people. What did Alex Mahon actually study? I, I can see the audience is excited by Yeah, that. right? No, I <laughs> studied physics. You physics? I studied physics for, I did physics as my first degree, and then I did physics PhD. I did seven years of physics, and after I'd done seven years of physics in kind of astrophysics and space science and high energy physics, and medical physics, I then realized I didn't want to be a physicist. It took me seven years to realize that. <laughs> Quick um, learner, right? Yeah, really, really fast on the uptake. Um, and I realized I didn't want to do it forever because actually continuing to study in science and, and, or engineering, as many people here will know, it is quite narrowing, like it's mentally narrowing. You know more about one area than anyone else in the world knows about it, but you only know that about one area uh, until you get much later on. And I realized I like knowing quite a lot of things about a lot of things, but not necessarily everything. And that my skill or what I enjoyed was how you apply those things together. I also realized that I really like being with people and, and I enjoyed that sort of emotional intelligence side of my personality about finding out about other people. And science, a scientific career can be quite isolating. It's not necessarily social based, it's more experimentation in what I was doing. So I decided to come out of physics I then went to be a management consultant. But, but, but before, before we go there, you were also an astronaut, right? That, I wasn't an astronaut. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be an astronaut from like, when I was very young till I was uh, in my 20s, and I led the European Young Astronauts, and I went to astronaut kind of convention, space camp training with Chinese and Korean and Russians mainly, and Americans. And, but then I found out that you need to be really, really fit to be an, like, physically fit <laughs> to be an astronaut, and I realized that was unlikely ever to happen for me. I had the science bit. I didn't really have the physical And fitness. how did that... How did that experience, do you think, shape you? That experience of, of being on space camp and, and, and working in that kind of field towards that kind of goal, did that, did that change you or was it a reflection think, of your personality? No, I think you're with people constantly, uh, and tech is it's wonderfully like this too. You're with people constantly, you're focused on logic, data, analysis, okay. and what the correct answer is as shown by those things. So you're surrounded by a world of people like that, and if you take advanced science, they're not people who care about, you know, uh, social media or physicality. You know, it's about intellect and, and pursuing the right answer. And I love that side of it. I love the data analysis and the logic and the intelligence of the pursuit of the correct answer. Okay. So you go from from your career in physics, you you go to business consulting, and you find your way into the strategy department. I mean, I'm eliding a few years, right? But you find your way into the strategy department at RTL, the largest commercial broadcasting group across Europe and part of the Bertelsmann media conglomerate. And from there, because I want to move forward, you, you move into Fremantle Media, which is a global production and distribution company and responsible for shows like Idol and X Factor and has subsidiary organizations all around the world, including here. Um, how did you experience that change? Was it, was it, did you feel like you'd, you'd arrived at some kind of destination or was it just a job or, or it was a retreat from the solitariness of the, and the introspection, or, I suppose, of the physics, but how did it feel to go from the one field to another? Um, so I always loved watching television. When I was a kid, my mum was always at work in a good way. And all I did was come home from school, switch on the television, and my brother and I just watched television all day long. You know, we'd switch it off the moment we heard her come in the front door. So to find out that you could actually have a job where watching the television was a legitimate part of it, and that knowing about television actually made me look really like I knew my job. <laughs> Once I found out about that, I've arrived. Like, how could one do anything but pursue a career in that, where a love of the medium um, makes you a really authentic leader in it. I just thought that that coalescence of what you like doing okay. and doing that at work is perfection. And many successful people, that, you know, they have found the thing that actually plays to their true hobbies or interests. So I, I loved that, you know, but then I came in through the business side and the analytical side, so I wasn't a producer. So sort of how do you then get into production? How do you add value to an area that you don't know and you haven't trained in was more the complex piece of it. Okay, so you, you rise through Fremantle, you, you become chief operating officer of Fremantle's, one of Fremantle's two large, three largest subsidiaries in, in the UK, Fremantle, and then you form a working relationship, a very close and sustaining working relationship and, and friendship with Elizabeth Murdoch, and together you build 
probably the noisiest and most nimble of the of the large independent production and distribution groups called Shine, right? And this this seemed to me, I mean, as as your friend at the time, to bring together several strands of your career, your love of the business of show business or whatever that was, television, but also this this commercial focus and and um, tough negotiation and a desire to create value. Whereas in that industry, typically those things are seen as separate, separate occupations or separate weights inside the business. Do you, do you, how, um, how did you find your time at Shine? You were building a business. It was a startup in a sense. Was it your first time in that kind of environment? It was my first time in the high growth of that environment, and it was my first time in being a shareholder in the business. So the, the you know, as everyone who's here from a startup knows, that gives you a different sense of what your mission and your purpose and your dedication to it is. It's very different to a job. You can't just leave it and get a better job elsewhere. So, but it also gives you huge energy because you look to yourself for answers and you look to solve situations rather than creating a get out. So I love that. We had a really high growth rate. When I joined the business, we were 40 million sterling in revenues. And by the time I left in 2013, 14, we were 700 million sterling. So sort of that massive growth. Um, and I think all the things we did that were really difficult at the time, like we bought other companies and we took debt just as Lehman Brothers kind of crashed and the markets crashed and we opened up internationally and I moved to LA when I had a sort of five month old baby and went back and forth every two weeks with a baby. All of those things in retrospect looked bonkers, but at the time they felt like a natural evolution of what we were doing because we were full of energy for it and then we had the next idea and things seemed to be going our way. It's easier in a way when you're the challenger brand when you're the challenger brand and you're growing, you've always got someone else really big to catch up to mm. and to challenge and to do different things to and to sort of say, well, they do that, we'll do this. Um, you sort of have that comparison to go against. So that made it easier as well. But in retrospect, I think, well, why did we, we were yeah. lucky. Yeah. No, we were How lucky. many children did you have in this period, if I may ask I, you? I had four children in the period and kept... I mean, four I, children? I still have four children. You but to, I gave birth to four children. Them. I, haven't got, high, I haven't lost any. A high retention rate. I, I, I gave birth to four children during that, yeah. But oh. it, to be honest, once you've got four children, it's easier to be at work. Um, <laughs> it's like pretty aggressive at home. Um, somebody with children in the audience. And, and then you leave Shine um, because the shareholders form a joint venture with another company, a merger with Endemol, and you move into digital special effects software, right? So you, you yeah. go back to a kind yeah. of techie, physicist-driven, mathematically-based yeah. heartland, yes? Yes. Why did you do that? I left behind the glamour and yes, the heels right? and the yeah. pink champagne of Cannes yeah. and, and went to coders. Well, I thought really hard about what to do next. I'd been running this amazing company and it was time to go. And we'd been at the pinnacle, we'd had all this growth. I thought, well, I can't do that again. And if I go to anything else like it, I'll be a poor facsimile of it, or I'll be constantly trying to reinvent something and I'll fail. Um, and, and, I'll, and then I'll forever be looking backwards. And I thought really hard about two things. One is, where's the growth? So when I had been in independent production, it had been the period of, of high growth. And the growth is all in tech. You know, right now in our world, the growth in tech. So therefore, the interesting people end up where the growth is. And then I thought about, it. I made like three circles for myself. Venn diagram, I can say Venn diagram in this world, it's not television. Um, and I thought, okay, like power and status, money, interest. And like, okay, I would love to overlap all those things, but which am I prepared to sacrifice? And I realized that for me, I put interest first. So I thought, I now, I, therefore, I need to use that to judge myself and like not go for the easy, which would be power and status and money. But then I'd be bored, and I thought, when I'm bored, I'm pretty crap at my job. And you get so, bored very quickly. No, I don't get bored very quickly, but, but if I've run out of things to do or new ideas, then one does default to what you already know, and then it's not that you don't work hard, it's just, are you any good anymore? I always worry you'll lose your edge, right? Because you're just doing the same thing, and, and that's fine at a certain point, but boring. Yeah. So then I realized that was tech, and then I looked really hard, though, because I wanted a tech company that was in the creative industries. And I wanted to go into private equity as well, so I thought that was interesting. So then I found the foundry, which is, um, Visual effects, not special effects. So it's like all the code and tech that lies behind um, kind of image processing, computer graphics from the early days when that started in London, in Soho, in the post-production industry in the 90s, and makes all the visual effects that are CG, that are in movies like 
Deadpool or um, Star Wars or, or frankly in every key piece of video content we see at the cinema nowadays. Mm. So they make all the code that lies behind that and they're in every visual effects Oscar winner for the past 10 years has used our software. So, so that sort of, it, it shows you how pervasive it is in the industry. And then I went there to do the next stage of that company which is how do we go into VR, how do we go into industrial design, but it's completely different business. Because although the, the customer is a digital artist, the staff are all coders. Okay, so now you arrive at Channel 4. We, I need to keep an eye on the time. You arrive at Channel 4. Can you, you, you have publicly stated, at least internally, that your, your focus points, the, your, your agenda is, is um, creativity, technology, commercial nous, and diversity, right? Can you talk to me about your, your sense of leadership and the requirements of leadership, and then a bit about, about how you think about traditional media in relation to the changing technology that the people in this space are making happen around us? Yeah, we try and sum that up. Um, so those are my priorities, absolutely, because unless we put technology and the consumer and our own culture at the center of the business, I feel we'll achieve nothing. And the culture of any creative business, and this is true in technology as it is in television, for me is a culture that needs to depend upon different people in order to get out of a kind of single tribe mentality. You need different people in order to innovate and come up with constantly new ideas. So ensuring that we always have a culture that celebrates that difference and therefore is diverse and inclusive is fundamentally important to me because I, as a senior female leader, believe that makes us better, right? You know, I believe if we're all the same in a monoculture, it's rather dull and we don't come up with anything. So that's why that's really important to me. Um, I think for me as a leader coming from creative, like science, then into creative, then into technology, and then back into creative, you know, the lessons are really different from those places. I'm a blend of that um, analytical, um, data-based driven conclusions and the, you know, the interest and the emotional intelligence in working with people. I'm endlessly curious about people and what makes them tick. So I like the blend of that left and right brain. And I think different situations of leadership require different bits of that. You know, if you're doing a meeting with um, investors, it's an entirely bit of that to it is to a meeting with a team of producers, you know, or a team of innovators and ideas. And it's different that the data analytics team need from you. But what I like about a role like this is all of those facets of one's personality are required. And, my job as a leader to bring what they need, whichever bit of that my staff need to the meeting or my stakeholders need to the meeting, rather than, and do that in an authentic way, that I'm still myself, mildly sarcastic, generally quite chatty, uh, quite honest, you know, and also suppress some of those facets in the right way in order to sort of create the strategy that the company needs. You know, I, I like the combination of that. And okay. I think we're in a time where that openness to who you actually are is actually what generations demand from leaders. Like, we don't really want the perfectly poised, come to office, different person on a Monday to Friday, wear a suit every day. We don't want that person anymore. So you like this in the office? It, yeah. <laughs> Not the boots. <laughs> Not the, the boots, boots, right? The boots are no. just for us here. But maybe next week, next the boots. Next week, I might be wearing these right. boots in London. All right. Alex, just one final question before I wrap. The, the, you talked about the non-commercial remit of Channel 4. But you yourself, as I know, are extremely commercially adept, extremely numerate, and a very tough negotiator. And you have, in your, in your kind of manifesto for your period at Channel 4, you have identified commercial smartness as one of the things the organization m needs. That, that would appear at first glance to be a contradiction. Can you just tell us how you square that circle? Oh yeah, it's not a contradiction, it's a brilliant thing, because the more money you make commercially, the more you get to spend it on good stuff. I mean, it's just, I, if I make more money, I get to spend it on things that deliver the remit, right? Diversity, creative innovation, public service television back to the British public, reflecting democratic values on screen by fighting fake news, independent journalism, noise making, interesting debate, uh, you know, intellectually stimulating programs, stuff in the arts, um, appealing to youth, um, thinking about how you reflect Britain in a sort of post-Brexit, pre-Brexit world. The more money I make, the more I get to spend on that. I mean, that's heaven. Right. And wh what, what do you imagine is the Channel 4 of five years' time? And then we're off. The Channel 4 of five years' time has to be uh, a channel that if you're Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, Amazon, you can't do without if you come to Britain. You know, that's our mission, is to remain at scale relevant to society. And, you, and you know, that's the special ability that you have as a public service broadcaster when you're of at scale. You know, you can do that in a way that 
maybe social media doesn't always reflect, you know, that, that independence and, and the clarity of purpose, you know, gives us that special advantage to be relevant. Right. Thank you very much, Alex Mahon. Thanks. Thank you very much, citizens of Slush.